Let's now talk about a technique that I call signal prompting. And this works because of the very specific functioning of large language models. Let's see how this works. First of all, I want to have just a list of historic figures. Maybe I want to say I want to have a list of 10 historic figures. And then I will get a list. And now what I can do is by just adding specific words that can be very abstract even without specifying exactly what I want, I can signal specific ideas or specific things. For example, I can add Europe and then it will add only people from Europe. And like this, we don't need to specify exactly what we would like to have, but we can just add an association. For example, I can say something like fall down or something like that is even a bit more abstract than this. And I don't have a specific idea, but I will get just associations with the word fall down. And maybe I don't have the very specific idea or I get some response that is something really unexpected and new that I didn't have in mind before. So for example, I could also add something like red. And then whatever is the connection with red, this can be very specific. So in this case, we see Mao Zedong, here Chinese communist. Then we also have some French people and some Russian revolutionary. So this can take really different forms. We could also, for example, add a year. So for example, 1900. And then we get figures that are connected to 1900. And this could be that they are born there, that they received maybe some prize there, or that they lived in this age. So this is very non-specific, but sometimes we can use this for brainstorming and just achieving some kind of association. Additionally, we can also do something similar to, for example, say in this case, start here. And then we say A, and then we can start this list like this. So then the list will start like this and it will also not include the starting point. So it will start directly because we signaled that we want to start directly. Or alternatively, I could use something like this. For example, I want to have it like this. So with these specific type of numbering, I can then again save it and I will get this result. So this is what I call signaling. So I'm just giving some cues to signal GPT what kind of a response I expect without being so specific about it. In this lecture, we want to talk about the reverse engineering prompt. This is a prompt that we can use to generate a very similar output, like something that we really like. For example, we have one text that we really like, maybe one blog article that we have written and that we really like. And we would like to get a prompt that generates such an output. We have done something similar when we have analyzed the style and tone of voice of a blog article that we have maybe written before and that we really liked. And this is now a similar technique. So in this case, we can use it in a simple and also in a little bit of a more complex way. Let's first demonstrate this with a more fun and playful way and afterwards see an example of how we can use it in a more realistic and useful way. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the prompt. I will give you answers and you will generate the questions about these answers. And in this case, I will make it about climate change. So I can now provide some answers and I can, for example, use answer one. Let's say answer one is carbon dioxide and let's use something funny. Maybe let's use cats and just see what we get as a response in here. So for example, here we get what is one of the most prevalent greenhouse gases responsible for trapping heat in the Earth's atmosphere. And then question number two, maybe not so directly related. What animal has been subject of debate due to its environmental impact? So it's still a little bit connected, let's say, to this environmental topic. So this is not too bad. But now let's use actually this technique to generate some prompt that we can then use to 
generate a similar output. So let's just demonstrate this in a new chat. I have, for example, this output and let's say I really like this output and I want to have now a prompt that can generate exactly this output. So therefore, I will now add our prompt in the beginning. So I will say, act as reverse prompt engineer. I will give you an example output. You will analyze this output and give me instructions that I can give someone to write a very similar style output. And then I just add some additional information, what should be included also in this prompt. And then I have, of course, this output. So let's see what kind of a prompt we get as a suggestion. So in this case, we see write a short passage of around 100 words. I think this is a little bit less than 100 words, but we know ChatGPT is not so good with counting and logical tasks that are a little bit more mathematical. And of course, we can always also regenerate this to get a, another suggestion. And we see in here it's again 100 words around. So let's just go ahead and copy actually this prompt and see what kind of an output we are getting with this prompt. And again, of course, we could also regenerate the response in here, or we could also try a, another suggestion of this prompt and try it again. And yes, it's a bit longer, so this is a little bit tricky to get it work, but it can again work as some kind of an inspiration and we can adjust some of the things that we are seeing in here. For example, in here, we could use a few less words or we could also regenerate it again and just use this next prompt because we know this is all about probabilities and therefore the results can be always a little bit different. And if I'm regenerating this response, I get somewhat similar responses actually. And in this case, it is a bit more closer to this five to six sentences, which is not really the case, even though the sentences are quite long, but we can also play around with this just to understand what kind of ideas can be included in our prompts. So this is a technique we can use to reverse engineer a given prompt to better understand what is important about a specific article to reproduce a similar style output. We know that the model, especially GPT 3.5, is struggling a little bit with more complex logical problems. So sometimes the responses are just not accurate. And to improve this accuracy, we can add the chain of thought prompt. For example, let's say we want to know how many words are in this text below. I will execute this prompt and I can actually use a real word counter that is a very simple tool. And in this case, we see it is actually 46 words. So these 43 words are not correct. But if I'm using the exact same prompt and I'm just adding this little information where I'm just saying, provide step-by-step -step reasoning. And then I will see that in this case, we see actually now we get the correct answer. So with this little trick, we can just trick ChatGPT into improving the accuracy and taking a little bit more care about giving a correct answer. And if we would like to ask, what is the fourth word in the second sentence? And now with this step-by-step -step reasoning, we would get the answer that is correct. So the fourth word in the second sentence is would, which is actually correct. So the second sentence and the fourth word is would. But if I would just use the same thing without this additional information, then I would get another word which would be completely wrong. So area is something that is, yeah, it's not the fourth word and not the first and not the second sentence. So this is something that we can add if we have some a little bit more logical problem that is a little bit more maybe, yeah, for ChatGPT difficult to give an accurate answer. For example, if I want to prepare for a job interview, then I can also just add this little prompt to get a little bit of a more logical response that helps me to be sure that I have an accurate answer. So with this reasoning, we can just improve the accuracy and we can be a little bit more sure that the answer is really correct and useful for us. And we can also follow along with the thought process of this response. In this lecture, we want to talk about the OpenAI Playground.
this is something that we can use as an alternative to ChatGPT's interface. Because in the playground, we have a little bit more capabilities. So this can be useful, especially when we want to fine tune some things like specific parameters. It can be also useful when we want to engineer something for some website. So this is something where the OpenAI APIs will be used and the parameters of the model can also be changed. This is why it can also make sense to have a look at this playground and even in some small cases where, for example, we have reached our limit of messages that we send or the website is down, then we can still access this playground. So first of all, we want to have a look at the pricing. So to do this, we can go just to openai.com and there we see pricing. Because with this, we don't pay any subscription or anything, but we have pricing per input and output. And of course, this depends on the model that is used. And you can see in this case, GPT 3.5 Turbo is the current model that is used. And also we have access to GPT 4. So we can actually use this for free, not for free, but without subscription. And then we have to pay just this amount per input and this amount per output. So we say in this case, most likely we will use GPT 3.5. So in here we have this price, so 0.15 cents per 1000 tokens. And remember that one token is about three fourths of a word. This means if we have, for example, 10 tokens, this is about seven to eight words. So we know that tokens are the basic building blocks and words can be broken down into smaller chunks, smaller building blocks, which are our tokens. And now this is what we have to pay. So you see that this is not free, but it's also not very expensive. So let's now first have a look at how we can access this playground. I will go back to openai.com and then we go to developers and then to overview. And in here, first of all, I'm already signed in. So for this, we have some free quota available, but we, after we have reached the limit of this quota, we have to also set up a paid subscription. So this we can do if we go to view APIs and there under billings, we can, if we want, set up a paid account. In my case, I've already done this, but you have also some free limit usually available to use. But in my case, I have just used my paid account. But now, how can we access this playground? This is just available from this top menu. And in here, we can now see that this looks a little bit more sophisticated. Because in here, we have now much more options. We can change to different modes. We will learn in a second what this is. We can use different models. So we can not only use the standard models, but some other models. And we also have a look at what this is. And we can modify the parameters of the model behind ChatGPT. So of the selected model. And then we can also give here some context. This is basically like a role that we give ChatGPT. Let's quickly demonstrate how this works and later on dive a little bit more into the details. For example, I can say you are an elementary school teacher. And then we can add the input. Let me just remove this in here. We can always remove a message by clicking on this little minus icon, but I want to now give an input. This is basically our prompt. So this is our user prompt basically. And in my case, I can say explain Explain relativity theory. And I don't give any other instructions, but only here we have assigned the role. And now ChatGPT will understand its role in this case and give an answer that is appropriate to its role. So we can see this is made a little bit more simple. But we can now also change it. And we could say you are a scientist talking at a conference. And this is now a completely different role. So as I've mentioned, we can remove messages, which I will do in here. And then we can just start from here again. We could adjust it if we click in it, but we can also just leave this input like this. And now let's see at this 
And now let's have a look at this response. So now we see this is now very different. Thank you all for being here today. This is the start because we have given ChatGPT this specific role. So this was the high level overview of how to use this playground. But now as we can see on the right side, there are many more options. We can see for example that we have different modes and also we have these parameters. So if I for example click on complete, I see it looks completely different. And this is why in the next lecture we quickly want to have a look at these modes and then also these different parameters. Let's now have a look at the different modes. We can change the mode, this is the standard mode chat, but we can change it to a different mode and we have complete and edit. And as you can see, those are legacy, so they are not really used anymore, but we can still have a look at how they work, what are the differences just very quickly, and then also see in which sense they could be still useful and how we could use them still in a meaningful way. So first of all, let's go to the edit mode. And in here, we can now give a text that we would like to edit. For example, we can go back actually to our chat and I will just use this answer. I will just click in there and copy everything from here. Then I will just change back to the edit mode, paste it in here. And I will say, just don't use numbers or just fix the grammar or add a paragraph in here or maybe remove one paragraph or make it more simple. Of course, we could do all of this also with standard JetGPT, but this is just a special mode that is just optimized for such edits. And as you can see, there's even a different model used. We are not using GPT-5 here. In fact, we can actually not even choose GPT 3.5 Turbo, the standard model, but this is a specialized model that is used in here. So if I'm just executing this, I say remove one paragraph and then the output will appear in here and one paragraph is removed. And now we could just use this button, use as input and it is back. And we could make some further adjustments like for example, remove all of the numbers or add more numbers. So whenever we want to make some edits, this can be done in here. So fix the grammar, add something in here. And this is just a little bit more easy also working with this text and the interface. So if you have something like this, which can be quite common, you you can use this edit mode. But aside to this edit mode, we also have this complete mode. Actually, previously this was the main mode, but this has been now replaced by the chat. And therefore, usually we will just use the chat. In here in the complete mode, there's just one thing that I find pretty interesting. It can be very useful in understanding and also explaining some of the concepts. And this is if we scroll down, we have this option show probabilities and we can change this to full spectrum. So for example, if I'm saying in here, tell me something about cats. I can just write this in here. This is basically our prompt and then I can submit this. And now I see exactly from which words the model has chosen which words. So for example, if I click on cats, then I see in this case, it was not a good example because this is 100%, but we have, for example, the next word after cat. So here, the most likely option was R. This is what the model has determined depending on all of the previous words. So all of this previous context. And in this case, it was just the most likely option and therefore it is also displayed in this green color. But there have been also actually other options and they could have been chosen with a specific probability. So for example, have would have been also possible. It was not picked, but there was a certain probability. And we know that GPT is all about predicting the next word with a certain probability. So this will be chosen with this given probability. And also we can adjust the way this word, the next word will be chosen by using those parameters. But we will talk about this in a second. So this is just visible in here. And if we have some of these darker values and if we have some of these more red words, then we can see that in these cases, some word has been chosen or to be more precise, actually some token has been chosen that has been a little bit less likely. 
So we can see also in here that some words are broken down. For example, domesticated has been broken down and probably the next one again, yeah, this is clear, has a very high chance or a high probability of being chosen. So this is just nice to see this visualized and we can just help also and we can also just use this to understand the concepts a little bit better. This is what I we actually want to do. But before we do this, I also want to mention this quick option of where we can use speech to text. So if I'm just for example activating my microphone, I can now, when I allow this, start to talk and then it will be transcribed. So now it will be transcribed and of course this can be now used as an input. But again, this is using the whisper model. So this is a model also from OpenAI. And again, we have to pay a little bit also for this. So we have to be aware of yeah, not using this in an incredible amount, but if we just use it a little bit and if we want to have also a closer look on the pricing, we can always have a look in here. And if we go now in this case to whisper, let me just search for whisper, then we see this is the pricing in this case. So you see it's not really super expensive. So these are now these different modes. And now of course we want to dive a little bit deeper into these specific parameters, how we can use them and what do they actually mean and what are some other options we can do in this playground. That's what we are doing in the next lecture. Let's now have a look if we are in the chat mode. We now want to have a look at the different parameters that are in this model available and we want to see how we can change them, what they mean and what is actually then the effect of those changes in the parameters. Because what we can do is of course we can adjust our own inputs, but as we have mentioned, we can also when we are an engineer, for example, a prompt engineer, and we are hired, let's say, to generate some prompts for an application, for example, then we can do these adjustments in here because this is then what can be used also in this application when we are working with the APIs and then this model is accessed with a specific set of parameters. So this can be actually done if, if we just have a look at view code in here and then we have all of those parameters like temperature, top P and all of those parameters that we are talking about. Also of course the role is also mentioned in here. So this is something that is in this case written in here. Of course, let's maybe change this system context again to let's say you are a teacher. And now this set of parameters we can also save in a preset. And then this preset we can use later on. And we will talk about this also in just a second. Now let's have a look at these parameters. So first of all, we know we can choose a model. We have already talked about GPT 3.5 Turbo, which is the standard model. This is the most capable in most situations. It is also the most cost efficient and therefore in most situations, this is the best model. If we, for example, need to have a higher token limit, then we can use this model. If we have a look at the pricing, we can see this is just another model with a different price. So in here, we can just increase the context. Because because we know we have this limit of around 4096 tokens and this is now just giving us more context. So like this, we don't have this limit of the tokens with 4000 tokens, but with more. And like this also the context, this means what this model knows from our previous inputs and responses will increase. But of course, this is also more expensive per token. So this is something we can use in some specific cases when it is needed. In our case, of course, we just stick with the standard model that is the most useful in most cases. But now what is this temperature? This temperature here, let's quickly have a look at what it says. It controls the randomness. Okay, what does that mean? We will understand this in just a second. So lowering the value results in less random completions. This means it will be more focused. So we can see that in this case, as the temperature approaches zero, the model will become deterministic. So basically in some way we can say the answers will be more generic, less creative. 
but it is very hard to describe it actually in words. And if we want to understand how this really works, we can best explain this when we go to the completion mode. Because when we now again use show probabilities, let's again just remove this and submit this again. And in this case, we can also demonstrate this with changing the temperature. So what this basically does is when we see these are the probabilities, it is a just a number in this case. It is not the real probability that the model will pick these words or tokens at. But this depends on the temperature. So if we have a very low temperature, it will basically boost this word with high probabilities and it will be less likely to pick a word with a lower probability. So if we increase this to a very high value, for example, this will make those picks more random. This means it is more likely that also a less likely word according to these probabilities will be picked. For example, it becomes more likely that then a word like can will be used. So like this, it gets a little bit more random. It may be a bit more creative, but it's hard to say, but it can also result actually in more nonsensical, if this is a word, responses. So this is something if we, for example, let's just demonstrate it with a high temperature. Tell me something about cats, I submit. And I think this is a pretty high value. So we can see in this case, it has boosted the low value. So actually in many cases, it has used these words that were not so likely. And like this, of course, it is also giving us more creative in some way responses. So cats are true hunters, many people house and so on. It, we run the risk of getting, of course, a not so meaningful and maybe a bit nonsensical response. So this is the temperature. And in the next lecture, we now want to talk about the other parameters and very specifically about something that is a bit more easy to understand, maximum length, stop sequences, and how this can help us. And afterwards, we also talk about those here. They are also pretty interesting. So let's have a look at them in the next lecture. And now we have something that is much more easy to understand. This is the maximum length. If we are experimenting with something and we don't maybe want to pay such a high price for this generation of the answers, we can just set a limit in a sense of a maximum length. And this is in tokens. So for example, if I use just the value 10, let me also remove this response and just again use this phrase explain relativity theory. I submit this. And then I get this answer and it will just cut off with a hard cut this response after this amount of tokens has been reached. It's very simple and it can just be used in an effective way to save on some cost when we are experimenting with the responses. Or if we are of course also, as mentioned before, doing this because we want to implement this into an application. So when we want to use the APIs, we can also use this parameter and experiment with the response. Maybe we don't want to have an incredible amount of length for these responses. So we want to set here some limits. I will mainly use it in this case to just not cause so long answers and just reduce the price a bit, even though it's not very expensive, this token generation. But then we also have some stop sequences. And they can be used in a similar way, but it's more in a structured way. So for example, let me just remove this response and change the user input in here. I want to say that generate a list of historic people. Maybe I will use this as a response. And now let's maybe increase also the maximum length to let's say just a random value like this. And we see we get this list of 10 people. Yeah, that's pretty nice. But now what if I want to structure this in a specific way? For example, I want this to stop whenever Cleopatra happens or whenever it reaches number six. So I could say stop after and then I use six dot because yeah, it is exactly a phrase. So we cannot only use sentences or words or just a sequence of characters. And I will now use six dot because I see this is how it appears in here. And then afterwards I will edit 
to this stop sequence field and I can add multiple even here. So I could also add, for example, Cleopatra. If this occurs, I want to stop and this will then not show this word actually. So this will then just stop after this word. Now, if I submit like this, let's again maybe remove it and submit again. We will see in this case, of course, the response is a bit different, but second would have been Cleopatra. So we see this is why it has stopped. Let's try it again without Cleopatra and let's quickly submit again. So we see it has now stopped after number six has occurred. And like this, we can just structure the output a little bit and just stop after a specific word. And now in the next lecture, we dive into these last parameters. And this top P will be in a way similar to the temperature. And it sounds quite complicated with this nucleus sampling, but we again try to make this as understandable as possible. And that's what we quickly want to talk about in the last lecture before then diving also into those presets. In my opinion, they are also pretty cool. And that's what we are doing now in the next lecture. That's why in the next lecture, let's dive into those last parameters here. Let's now have a look at those last parameters. We've already learned about the temperature, which is about increasing, which makes our responses more random if we increase the temperature. This can result in a little bit more creativity. And if we decrease it, it will be just a bit more deterministic, basically. So it will be a bit more focused, we can say. And now something that is doing something very similar is the top P, but it's doing it in a different way. And again, we want to understand what it is actually doing, because actually this is something that is very mathematical because this is about the sampling method behind this, but we try to break it down in a simple way. So let's first of all read what it says. Controls diversity via nuclear sampling. So we don't need to understand nucleus sampling, but in this case, 0 0.5 means half of all likelihood weights options are considered. So let's now dive into understanding this. For this, we want to just jump into the mode of complete again. As we have seen in here, if we want to just generate this response again, so we just leave the temperature, let's say at a more normal level of maybe like this, and then let's also remove the stop phrase. We don't need it. And now let's submit this response and then we can see what this is doing. So we have this top P. This means in this case, all options are okay to be considered. But once we decrease this value, we basically cut off some words. So if we set it to, let's say 50% or 0 0.5, this will now basically remove some of these words. This will now basically cut off some words that are considered. So for example, let's maybe use to demonstrate this some pretty low value of let's say 0 0.2. So this means only the top percentage values will be considered. So I press again, submit, or uh, let's maybe remove this one. So like this. And now we see that this is more green because in here we can see that now only words have been considered with a specific threshold. So only tokens with a combined weighted probability of, in this case, more than 80% will be considered. So if we reduce the value, so anything that is less than 20% of this weighted probability of the token, then this will be removed. And again, we don't need to understand the specifics. The important thing is that, so the lower we set this value, the higher this cutoff will be. So for example, if we set it maybe to some value in between here, so 50% or let's maybe use something like this, it will become less green because there's now a broader range of words that are considered. And again, we are not changing really those probabilities and those weights. This is what we do more with the temperature, but we just use a cutoff. And then the lower we use this value, the less words are even considered. So this is about how many words are considered. So in this case, let's demonstrate it with the value of, let's say, around 0 0.28. We execute it. 
And now there are a little bit more words considered and this is especially in these cases where the word was not so sure. So for example in here we have abilities around 20%. So this means there have been just more words considered with a somewhat equal distribution of probabilities. So it sounds all a bit complicated, but basically it means when we have a lower value, it uses less words and it only considers the most likely words. And the lower it is, the fewer words we use. So for example, if we use a very high value, then we can see if we submit it again, it will also consider words that are a bit less likely. We can see there are some of these words now picked and now with the temperature we can just increase basically the likelihood of also so we can increase we can basically give the words a boost that are not so incredibly likely. So we can boost them a little bit and if we increase it we will see that more words will be chosen that are a bit less likely per default. So if I submit this and let's remove it again I will submit this then we see that now we can even actually increase it more to see how this really looks like. So if it's a bit more extreme, we can see it gets more common that actually some words are also picked that are not that likely. And if we use a more extreme value even, it gets at some point not really nice even. Yeah, in this case actually I find it still okay, but it's getting more random, just like this. And if we have a very low value, it becomes very deterministic. So like this, we can also influence basically the, let's say, creativity and randomness or how focused this should be. So this is what we can use with this top P value. Additionally, we also have frequency penalty and presence penalty. This is what we also want to have a look at quickly in the next lecture all of these options including these parameters this system role we want to see now what are those presets because now that we have all of this understanding we will understand those presets so if we want to browse them we can just go to browse examples first of all we can save our preset so for example if i want to save this as teacher preset I can do this. I can give a um, description and I can also make this available for other people so they can, I can just send it as a link to them and they can also see it. So I will save it now for me and now it is available to pick from this list. So this is something we can do. But we can also use some example. And in my case, let's actually just delete this preset and afterwards I want to have a look at these examples. Because in here we have some of these presets where all of the configuration, all of the setting has already designed to fulfill one specific use case. For example, we have grammar correction or we have explain code or we have emoji translation. We can select some of them. We will see, of course, the API request. We can just use also the APIs. We'll talk about this, of course, as mentioned later on. But we can also open this in our own playground and play around with this. So, for example, we have in here this system. This is just, again, the role with a description. And also we have some specific settings for these parameters. And now if I, for example, just use this sentence, I click submit, this will be translated into those emojis. So I could remove it and let's try this again. And we get another translation of this text into emojis. So this is pretty cool. I can, for example, say I want to become a great data scientist. And if I execute it, let's remove this, it will translate this into these emojis. So like this, we can just choose from these presets. And if we want to see more of them, we can again just go to examples, which is also already opened in my case in here. And here I can search for some other examples. So let's have a look at some interesting use cases. Again, mood to color, turn a text description into a color. 
can be some fun use case or emoji chatbot or rap battle writer. So here you see that there are actually some really nice use cases. I want to see this one, for example. So if I open this in playground, I will see this is some description. We can add a message. Actually, let's just use this basic message in here. I submit it and then I assume this will just translate our text into a SQL command. Let's actually just use this message. And if I have a look at this, it will actually translate natural language into SQL. So given the following SQL tables, your job is to write a query given on a user's request. So we see we can enter some specific tables and then based on these tables, we can generate a query just from natural language. So let's have a look at how this would work. So we can see this gives us just the output. So it's pretty nice. It's pretty cool what we can do with these presets. And in general, this gives also some inspiration of what can be done with these parameters and then this role that we can give in here. And this can be then, of course, also used in an application. And this is something, again, we discuss in the OpenAI's API section. So this was it about using the playground. In my opinion, again, this can be very useful to just use some very specific model, a very custom model, some more advanced capabilities of adjusting some parameters and giving us a deeper understanding also of the GPT model. But it can be also useful, of course, when we want to develop some model and fine tune it to be used in an application when we want to access the APIs. So I hope this part was helpful, even though it was a little bit more advanced. And I hope to see you in another section, especially the API section. So hope it was helpful and see you in the next one. Finally, let's have a look at those two last parameters, the frequency penalty and the presence penalty. They work in a very similar way and they are also not so complicated to understand like top P or the temperature parameter. Let's actually bring this back to a more normal value. So the frequency penalty is very straightforward. It penalizes new tokens based on their existing frequency in the text so far. So like this, we can decrease the likelihood to repeat the same tokens and eventually also actually the same sentences and the same ideas. So we can just make this a bit more new basically and the thing should be less frequent. It is basically so like this, we can basically make the model a little bit less repetitive. So we can decrease the probability of repeating sentences or repeating content. So this is what this frequency penalty is. And also the presence penalty works in a similar way, only that it is not based on the frequency, but just on whether this appears or not at all. So it is a bit more strong because if one token is even already appearing once, it is then already decreasing this likelihood and adding some penalty. So like this, we can also decrease the probability to talk about one topic as a whole more frequently. This is now just one effect how I describe it, but it's actually hard to determine this, what this effect exactly does. Basically, it's making a topic less frequently or less likely to appear again, but it has to be tried out and played around with a little bit. So these are all of the parameters we can use. And this is especially important, as we have mentioned, when we are engineering something, for example, an API, we are the prompt engineer for an application maybe, and they need to have this weight of these parameters and we can customize it like this. And then of course we can view the code and this is then something that we can also use in our application. This will be then with these weights. Of course, we will dive into this also in another part of the course when we are talking about the OpenAI APIs. So if you are curious about this, just check out this section as well. And now what we can do is we can also save this as a present. This means we can always access it later again and just have this saved like this, which can be very useful. And also what we have in here is we can access some 
samples. And also what we have available in here is we have some presets. And what that exactly is, how this works, we now want to have a look at in the next lecture.